Hello. On this edition of MTA Commuter Connections, MTA has plans in the works to improve local area bus service in our region. The project is known as BNIP. We'll have details. We'll also introduce you to a next train arrival system for light rail. Ahead, a look at MTA police efforts at fighting crime and keeping transit safe. And we'll address your customer questions and concerns in our Ask the MTA segment, right here. I'm Paulette Ostrich. Welcome to MTA Commuter Connections. The MTA is dedicated to making your transit ride the best in the nation. To assist in the effort, MTA has plans, in the not too distant future, to update its service routes and lines and make them more efficient for the hundreds of thousands who ride MTA bus each and every day. The plan is known as the Bus Network Improvement Project, or BNIP for short. MTA Director of Service Development, Michael Walk, joins us with more on this very industrious project. Hello, Michael. Hi, how are you doing? Good to see you. Tell us, what is the Bus Network Improvement Project? It's an um, effort to craft a five-year transit development plan for the Baltimore bus network um, that's informed by our riders themselves, uh, potential riders, as well as the data sources that we have in terms of um, where people are trying to get to, where the jobs are, trying to bring the network up to speed uh, with the times. Now, why do you think the plan and project is necessary? Well, really, it's funny because it's been over a decade since the MTA has really taken a, a hard look at the bus network. Um, and so it's, um, it's normal for a transit agency every five years or so to look at its system and update it. And so it's been quite some time first for us. And um, we hear from our riders and we hear from people that want to use transit that it's time to take a hard look at the system and make sure that it works to its fullest potential. That's great. When did the idea to make the changes come about? Um, actually, over several, uh, more than a year ago, really, is when, when the whole project got off the ground. Um, we started several different initiatives to try to get customer feedback to make service improvements. Um, some examples of those things are like the Rate Your Ride project. Um, and the more that we started looking into trying to make changes and improvements, the more that we found that holistic changes had to be made, not just sort of piecemeal, one line at a time improvements. Um, speak to the process from beginning to end regarding the changes being implemented. Yeah, so we, um, we went through a public engagement phase in September of uh, 2013. We started then. We um, gathered a lot of public feedback from, I would say, probably about a thousand different people. Um, talked to them face to face, talked to them online, and now we're moving into the phase of the project where we're crafting a bus network that we think really maximizes the potential for transit in the region. Um, we're moving in April, we'll be publishing the plan along with a five-year implementation uh, plan in order to make those changes over time. And the first phase of changes will actually start in August of this year. Wow, that's exciting. Yes, it is. Um, how many bus lines are expected to be affected by BNIP? Um, at first glance, it looks like about every bus line will have some sort of change to it, whether it's a stop a change um, or a realignment of some kind. And there's also additional lines that we're looking to implement as long as funding allows. So about every rider will notice something uh, with their daily commute at this point. Wow, that's great. So will the changes all take place on one day, or will they be phased in over a period of time? That's a really good question. They're going to be phased in over time. Um, right now, we're developing that phasing plan. Um, but we're, our plan is to put it all together so that over a span of five years, um, we will be able to implement those top priority changes. So in August, for instance, of this year, um, we're planning to make a lot of schedule adjustments to try to improve mm -hmm. the quality of service, um, to make people's lines more reliable that, as they currently exist today. And then after that, we'll start working through the different changes, realigning routes, um, implementing new lines, et cetera. And they'll all become in packages over the next five years. Wow, that's a major, major project. It is a very big how, project. How many people or, or MTA departments are involved in, in a project this huge? Um, actually, a lot. Uh, um, I'd struggle to list them off the top of my head, but you know, we um, need to keep our customer information offices involved, our engineering, our capital planning folks, so that we are buying the right number of buses, um, building the right t kinds of facilities. Um, Obviously, the finance uh, people, the marketing mm -hmm. folks. So, I mean, it's a, it's a very big project, not only inside the MTA, 
but also stakeholders outside the agency um, we're involved in in this project as well. Absolutely. How are the proposed changes to service received by the commuting public? Well, a lot of the proposed changes themselves haven't been um, released yet. We're still sort of in that final planning stage. Um, and then come April, we'll release the whole plan um, to the public. Um, but the ideas um, that we've talked about already in public sphere, um, like improving quality of service mm -hmm. and making the trying to make the buses come more frequently, even if that means that um, a rider might have to walk a little bit farther to a bus line. Those general themes were well supported during the public engagement um, phases. Folks wanted more frequent transit service and they're willing to walk a little bit farther to the stop in order to get it. Well, that's great to hear. Mm -hmm. So I think you kind of mentioned this, but just uh, if you could reemphasize, what planning or project phase are we in right now? So uh, we're in what we call sort of network design. Um, where if you imagine the MTA currently has 62 local bus lines as well as all of the, the light rail and the subway. And so right now we're in the phase where we're taking those 62 lines and making sure that we have them going on the right streets, so they're stopping at the right places, getting all that finalized um, for the future. Um, and so the next phase will be then launching that plan to the public and allow them to see what we thought and get additional feedback from the public on that whole plan. And again, the first change is likely to take place? It's August of this year. August, wow. Mm -hmm. well, we'll be watching and waiting. Yeah, <laughs> should be a lot of fun. Uh, uh, we're very excited to make the system work better. Yeah, wow, that's great. Thank you so much for being here. I'm glad we could be. Enjoying talking to you. Coming up next, a look at a new system design to let you know the delay status of your light rail train. It's just ahead. We've talked about big improvements coming soon to bus, but light rail is also on the bandwagon for something new and exciting. Coming to a light rail stop near you, new signage designed to keep you informed and aware of the status of the next approaching train. It's all part of light rail's new next train arrival signage system, and MTA Deputy Director of Engineering and Construction, Vernon Hartsock, joins us with information on this new feature. Hello, Vern. Hello, Paula. How are you? Good to see you. Good to see you. Um, what is Next Train Arrival Technology and how does it work? Next Train Arrival Technology is an up and coming feature uh, offered by many transit systems now in the MTA. We're in a technology similar to what's used in navigation systems, is based on global positioning system uh, equipment that's located on each of our trains that allows the train to ascertain where it's at in a geospatial orientation. Uh, every so many seconds this information is transferred to a computer system and that computer system is also apprised of the light rail service map, the location of each station, the speed of the train and other pertinent data. That system is then able to make predictions about when that train will arrive at its next station and stations thereafter throughout the service area. Patrons can then call upon this system using either a uh, traditional computer in their home or an internet capable smartphone where they can request when the train will arrive at a given station that they're interested in boarding and the system will relay this projection in that manner. Otherwise, at each of our passenger stations we have new signage which depicts the next two trains that are arriving to that stop for each route that the light rail line services. Oh, wow. When did the idea for the use of this technology on light rail come to the MTA? This idea occurred to us several years ago because we observed this feature was in use at other transit properties around the country. We have had as a goal to bring this to our patrons for a number of years. With the advent of the recent PA LED project for light rail, that gave us the mechanism to be able to roll this out for the public use. Oh, fantastic. How do you think this will make a difference for light rail riders? 
Oh, it'll make a substantial difference because patrons can have the convenience of knowing how long do they have before the train will arrive. This can give them the option to go and have a coffee or stop and do some shopping or otherwise plan their trip a little bit more accurately to help them budget their time. And we believe that people will be very interested in this service and it will be a great benefit to our riding patrons. Yeah, I think so. It makes for a less harried trip. Absolutely. Um, exactly what information is, is displayed on the signs? What information is displayed on the signs basically tells you the next arriving train in terms of its destination, such as a BWI train or Hunt Valley train, and then the time in minutes until its arrival at the station. Um, will the next train arrival alerts be available during just drive time or, or all the time? It will be available during all of the time that the trains are operating on the line. Um, when did actual construction of the system begin and, and how long did it take to get it up and running? The construction of the PALE system itself began about two years ago. However, the development for the next train arrival portion of that project started about one year ago and took about that amount of time to come to complete fruition and now into the testing stage that uh, people can observe when they go to the stations today. Will the next train arrival system be at every light rail station? Yes, it will be at each light rail station. Will customers eventually have access to this information on their computers or, or their mobile phones? Yes, we're soon to roll out a feature that will allow patrons to log in from a computer or from a, a smartphone with internet capability and they will be able to access a website that will give them information on when the next train will arrive at a given stop. They'll also be able to select an origin and a destination and it will tell them the next trains that will arrive at the origin and how long it will take those trains to take them to where they want to go. So there's a number of features that this system will offer for folks using their commuter, computers or handheld uh, mobile smartphones. Wow, I love that. That's great. How, how expensive is something like this? How much did it cost to implement the system? The total cost of implementation for the next train arrival portion of the project was just over a million dollars. And is the MTA using this type of system on its other service systems? Yes, the MTA has a similar technology that's been in use on our MARC commuter rail system and we also have plans to deploy this technology on other modes of transportation in the future. Are other light rail train systems around the country using this technology, do you know? Yes, there are. There's a number of properties around the nation that have this feature and we know from those practices that it's a highly sought after feature and it's of great benefit to the riding patrons. Well, well congratulations to you, Vern. That's very exciting. I can't wait to, uh, to check this new system out. Thanks, Vern. Coming up next, a look at the crime-fighting efforts of MTA police and what they're doing to help keep transit safe in Maryland. Stay with us. We often see MTA police patrolling subway stations and trains here in the area, but the reach of MTA police is to points far beyond here. Many may not be aware of it, but MTA police are responsible for transit throughout the state of Maryland. As MTA service like commuter bus and mark train extend well beyond the borders of the Baltimore region, keeping transit safe in this post 9-11 world is a huge responsibility. It's a challenge MTA police take on with honor and distinction each and every day. Joining us with a look at these efforts is MTA Police Captain and Commander of Special Operations, Kelly Holman. Hello, Captain Holman. Hello, Ms. Ostrich. How, How are you? Good. No, nice to see you. Thanks for you, too. Um, our viewers and customers see MTA Police on duty throughout the system and on, and on the streets. Can you tell us what is the mission of the MTA Police Force? The mission is simple. The MTA Police, we uh, professionally enforce the law, protect our transit community, our employees, and facilities with dignity and respect. And how long has the agency existed? Since 19, 1971. What are its beginnings? Well, years ago, 1971, we were founded by state legislation. And with that state legislation, it gave us full police authority, as well as a fully commissioned police department to enforce all state laws, city and county codes. 
And how large is the force? How many divisions and, and how many sworn officers? Do, we have do approximately have? 157 sworn officers, two districts, which is a northern and a, a southern district, and those two dif districts are separated basically um, by the North Avenue barrier line. It gives you anything north of North Avenue is considered northern district, and anything south of North Avenue is considered the southern district. Um, just opposed to those two districts are the Special Operations Unit, which is what I am the commander of. And that houses our K-9, our motor unit, our criminal investigations unit, and our tactical operations unit. Wow, it's a lot of responsibility. Yes. <laughs> As an agency whose focus is on transit, what would you say is the most widely held misconception uh, about the force? About the MTA p police mm -hmm. force? That there's no authority other than inside MTA. That is our main priority, to protect our facility and our employees and our patrons. However, we are a full police authority, police department through the state of Maryland, which means we can enforce the laws outside of our property as well. Oh. Um, how long have you been with the MTA Police Force? July 11th of this year will be exactly 20 years. Wow, congratulations. Thank you. What did you do before joining and, and, and how and why did you become a part of the force? Hmm. Before joining, I guess I could say I was high school, so I started here as a baby. Wow. So this is my home, my second family. And my reasoning for joining, although MTA chose me, I in, two ch in, in turn chose them. Growing up in the city of Baltimore, riding the buses and the subway, I saw something in this agency that I wanted to be a part of, just helping people and being a, uh, a figure that could invoke change. I wanted to be a part of that. Make a difference. Yes. Yeah. Um, take us through your progression from first joining to your promotion as, as captain. Oh, um, I joined the police force. It took me forever. <laughs> the process is lengthy with all police departments. Upon being accepted and going to the police academy, I spent six, years, six months of my life, eight hours a day in school, not just educationally, but physical fitness, getting in, in, um, getting in shape, mentally prepared for the position as a police officer. I graduated the police academy after six months as the top of my class amongst my MTA counterparts. Huh. I hit the street, went through field training, and my first year being on the street, I was the officer of the year for the entire wow. department. And I still can say I'm the only female that has been officer of the year in the last 20 years. What are your responsibilities as captain? As captain, I am responsible for our special operations division. And again, that, is, that encompasses our K-9 unit the motor unit. We have a command communication vehicle which resembles much like a tractor trailer mm -hmm. and that vehicle helps us with all types of communications just in case there's some type of um, homeland security issue or if our actual communication system goes down within the agency itself that vehicle is our backup. On top of that I do criminal investigations and the uh, tactical operations unit which handles all our anti-terrorism op operations. What should transit riders and even criminals know about the cameras that we see in and around the trains? First and foremost, they work. We do have live monitoring at our police monitoring facility. So whenever there is a camera somewhere in your eyesight, that it is actually being viewed and monitored constantly. That's good to know. Um, what um, modern day tools in policing does MTA have it as, its, as its disposal? One thing I can um, say right off the top is all our police officers are issued departmental cell phones. And on those cell phones is a software called Pocket Cop. Pocket Cop enables an officer on the street to actually use that software to run a background check, get a criminal history, find out that the person that they are dealing with is of a violent nature or actually are wanted from by some other law enforcement agency. That's an immediate tool that keeps us from having to um, contact the dispatcher if the dispatcher is busy with another call for service and gets an immediate tool. Um, along with pop, Pocket Cop, we have uh, MDTs, which is a modal data terminal with, inside each patrol car. That's a computer that officers can use at their disposal. When they're checking parking lots, they can check uh, tags on vehicles and things of that nature. We have license plates readers. Those are affixed to the 
back of a patrol car. So as vehicles ride down the street and the officer rides down it as well, that license plate reader zooms in on that license plate and can give you the background for that vehicle as well as the registered owner. Well, those are great tools. Mm -hmm. So tell us a little bit about the electronic device theft awareness campaign. That campaign was initiated to assist in making the public aware, letting them know that their electronic devices are just as they are important to them, they're important to someone else. We wouldn't traditionally walk around and, with $700 cash in our hand right. just holding it. Right. So it's the same thing when you have your electronic device in your hand. You want to make sure you put that somewhere secure so someone won't take it from you. Well, Captain Holman, it was a pleasure talking with you today Thanks and finding out too. more about the MTA Police Force. Thank you. Pretty amazing organization. Thank you. The MTA has several thousand employees working hard each day to keep transit running in Maryland. Each month, we've made it a point to introduce you to some of the faces you normally wouldn't see in your daily travels on MTA. On this edition, we bring you one of the behind-the-scene faces responsible for keeping light rail operating. Train number one, select in two Mount Royal with proper rail and signal. Proceed north. Thank you, sir. My name is William R. Johnson. Most of people call me Rudy. I'm a light rail controller. And basically my job consists of somewhat like an air traffic controller. Uh, what we do is we direct trains. 5014, so we have the trains to stop at various points, give us a call and make sure it's all right for them to proceed. We set the tracks for trains so they can go in and out of various grade crossings. We also uh, supervise the operators and we make sure that they get their train, they relieve their trains on time. We make sure they depart the stations on time. And we also make sure that the trains are on time for the public. And our job consists of serving the public and that's very important to us. We have the ability to control the tracks and the switches from up here, but they're really out in the field. We have to be in direct communication with the train operators at all times. That is essential. Uh, because without direct communication with the train operators, we might not know exactly where they are and what they're doing and what they're about to do. We select M1 Mount Royal with proper rail and signal proceed north. MTA is, is an excellent place to work. I've been with MTA for 22 years. I started as a bus operator. From bus operator, I went to mobility van operator. And from mo mobility van operator, I came into supervision as a light rail controller. There is career advancement with the MTA. And your career would soar, would take off. It's, it's, it's an excellent place to work for. With the time that I've put in, with the career advancement, I'm proud to say that the MTA has been very good to me, and I would like to think of myself as a good example of what the MTA is and what it is going to become. You're doing a good job. Thank you. Thanks to all the dedicated employees of MTA who assist and serve our transit patrons each and every day and who make transit possible. Next, we'll answer your customer questions and concerns in our Ask the MTA segment. Stay with us. Welcome back. MTA Systems Engineering's Tammy Bolden joins us with a few MTA customer questions and concerns. Hi, Tammy. Hi, how are you? Good, thanks. What do you have for us today? Well, we got a couple of interesting questions regarding Metro, mainly about the escalators. So, first question. So why, during rush hour, do you have more trains going west than you have going east? And then in the afternoon, it's flipped. Well, if trains are operating on schedule, the trains are pretty much evenly divided in both directions. So when a train departs John Hopkins, there is a train scheduled to leave Owens Mills three minutes later. So our trains typically run eight minutes apart during peak periods and then 10 minutes apart during non-peak operation. Next question. My concern and issue is the 23 bus route. I feel as though that every route that's going towards Route 40 should go through Wildwood Parkway. They have selected trips that goes through there, but they're not consistent. To serve any area that has 
a distance from the main street, the MTA has to consider three things. One, you have to consider um, that we have to divert that particular bus. Two, we also have to add delay times to the passengers already on board the bus. And three, there is an increase in operating costs. Now, in the case of Wildwood Parkway, it adds 1.5 miles plus seven minutes round trip. It can, it's a big convenience and a benefit to those already living along Wildwood Parkway, but it's an inconvenience for passengers already on board that bus. So currently, the MTA sends selected trips up Wildwood Parkway during most of the day and every trip during the late night hours. Next question. I want to know why the escalators are never working, why they can't work on them at night when people are not using them. The MTA Metro houses 81 escalators, and each of those escalators are equipped with multiple safety features that's designed to carefully shut down should an issue arises. This ensures the integrity of the equipment and the safety of our passengers. The MTA makes every effort to ensure that each unit has a scheduled maintenance service um, during the non-peak weekday hours and, and or during the weekends. Should you have any questions, please visit us at mta.maryland.gov or visit us on Facebook or Twitter. We would love to hear from you. Well, thank you, Tammy. Thanks for bringing us a lot of great information no and problem. answering the customer questions. It's thank good seeing you. you. You too. Well, that brings us to the end of another Commuter Connections program. Thanks for joining us. We'll see you next time. Take care.